In 1887, in response to concerns over railroad rates, Congress passed, and President Grover Cleveland signed, the Interstate Commerce Act. This act is historically significant, as it represents the very first time the federal government regulated an aspect of the U.S. economy in any significant way. The Interstate Commerce Act required that railroads publicize their shipping rates. It also required that railroads charge the same rates for short-distance hauls as they did for long-distance hauls, and who end price discrimination against smaller markets. To enforce these mandates, Congress created the Interstate Commerce Commission, the ICC, the nation's first regulatory agency. The Commission was given the power to review rates for the reasonableness, as well as the power to order the discontinuance of any rates it determined to be unreasonable. In 1893, Congress expanded the authority of the ICC to include rail safety in addition to rates. The railroad companies argued that the law exceeded congressional authority under the Constitution, and so they filed a lawsuit. In 1894, in a 5 to 3 decision, the Supreme Court upheld the Interstate Commerce Act as a constitutional exercise of congressional power under the Interstate Commerce Clause. Despite this, over the next decade, the court interpreted the act narrowly, in ways that favored the railroads. For example, the court decided that while the ICC could decide whether existing rates were legal, it could not insist on a reduction in future rates. It also decided that the ICC did not have the authority to prescribe minimum or maximum rates. By 1906, the court had decided 16 cases involving the railroads and the Interstate Commerce Act, ruling in favor of the railroads in 15 out of the 16 cases. Eventually, Congress responded by amending and strengthening the law. In 1906, Congress passed the Hepburn Act, which explicitly gave the ICC the authority to establish rates, including minimum and maximum rates. In 1910, the Mann-Elkins Act further expanded the Commission's rate-setting ability, and gave it the ability to suspend rate increases until the Commission determined whether the rate was reasonable or not. In addition, President Teddy Roosevelt began aggressively pursuing cases against the railroads and other large corporations. Among other successes, he obtained a $30 million fine against a railroad that had violated the Mann-Elkins Act. However, the rail industry faced a major crisis during World War I. America's war effort depended on transporting large numbers of people, and large amounts of material, from the west, to the east coast. The rail system became paralyzed by gridlock, which was seen as a direct threat to national security. As a result, on December 17, 1917, the federal government did something that it has never done before, or since, it nationalized the nation's railroad industry. For the next two and a half years, the railroad industry was operated by the United States Railroad Administration, a new federal agency created specifically for that purpose. It instituted several reforms designed to increase efficiency. Nationalization was never intended to be permanent, and the railroads were returned to their original owners in March 1920. However, this experience had two significant impacts. First, it caused Congress to consider new legislation designed to fix the perceived defects in the rail industry. It would pass such legislation in 1920, bringing significant changes. Second, it also caused government at all levels, including the military, to look much more favorably on renewing public investment in roads. The age of the automobile had arrived. 